on a shipping clerk's idle scheme turns into the biggest heist in U.S. history, no one's more surprised than he is. But sudden wealth can have lethal consequences. Friday, December 8th, 1978, New York's Kennedy Airport. It's business as usual at the Lufthansa Overseas Cargo Terminal. Each year, billions of dollars in cash and merchandise clear this room from all over Europe. The lure of this untold wealth can be intoxicating. And a Lufthansa shipping clerk named Louis Warner fell deeply under its spell. Deep enough to be in way over his head. When he wasn't gambling away his paycheck, Lewis Warner and his best friend and co-worker, Peter Grunwald, thought up ways to rip off Lufthansa. Years earlier, they even drew floor plans and copied employees' schedules. In fact, they devised what seemed like a perfect plan, except for one crucial detail. The only thing that required the plan to work were robbers, <laughs> which Grunwald and Werner had terrible difficulty finding. They fought over what to do next, and their friendship disintegrated. The plan sat nearly forgotten. As months passed, Werner went further into debt. He began receiving threats from his bookie, a man named Marty Krugman. Marty Krugman hung out at a bar called Robert's Lounge, which lay just outside the airport and just outside the law. Robert's Lounge is one of those places you wouldn't want to be caught dead in. Though for the guys who come here, being caught dead is an occupational hazard. It was the haunt of a gang of hoods and cronies, known predictably as the Roberts Lounge Gang. Their lives was a series of scores. Scores meaning a, a job, a criminal job, whether it be an armed robbery, or to beat somebody out of money, a local uh, uh, proprietor, or a scam. They went from one to another. Werner, hopelessly in debt, realized he had something that would erase his obligations to Krugman and make himself a little money besides. The heist plans. Krugman shared the idea with his boss, Jimmy Burke, a mob enforcer who owned the lounge and the gang. Let's go in the back of Burke had an incredible, violent reputation. In one case, uh, Jimmy was known to have broken every single bone in the face of someone who was late on a payment. Now Burke was in trouble himself. The mob demanded he keep the cash flowing. He needed a lucrative plan. He needed Werner's plan. Burke's major crime families had their hooks in Kennedy Airport. Burke would have to have their blessing first. Burke told the plan to his boss, Paul Vario, a captain of the Lucchese crime family. Burke promised him the lion's share of the profits. The entire haul was expected to be around $2 million. Permission granted. No, you're gonna you're gonna Armed with Werner and Grunwald's plan, Burke and the Roberts Lounge Gang hammered out the details. They'd go in late when only a skeleton crew of 10 was on, striking while the graveyard shift was at lunch. The gang would break into two teams. Team one would capture the employees in the lunchroom, 
Team 2 would secure the cargo terminal. It was a brilliantly simple plan. Remember, these guys aren't, they're not cowboys necessarily. They don't want to go in shooting up a place because it puts a tremendous amount of pressure on them afterwards. Law enforcement will tend to be much more um, uh, dedicated sometimes when you know, people get hurt or killed. So they, they don't want to do that. They want to make it simple, low-keyed. To ensure that simplicity, the Mafia hedged its bets. They sent along a mob soldier to act as their eyes, ears, and if necessary, their hired gun. So Burke felt the pressure for the plan to succeed. It wasn't just a matter of pride or money. It was a matter of life and death. The scheme moved forward. There was no turning back. No room for mistakes. Monday, December 11th, 1978. Just before 3 a.m., Burke's team pulled into the Lufthansa air cargo terminal, right on schedule. Once they arrived, the team split. Team one rushed into the building. Team two pulled the van into position. Clearing the security gate, they moved toward the loading dock, where they would wait for the all-clear signal. Team one headed toward the lunchroom. On their way, they split up to sweep for any employees who weren't at lunch. Don't move! Don't get Where are the other guys? Where are the other guys? In the lunchroom. They surprised the cargo Where's agent the in his office. You went home. Come look at us. Good. Oh, you just stay with him. Yep. One go. man down, go. Go. nine to go. Inside the van, the waiting was becoming unbearable. Take this off. Can't and so anymore. were the heavy ski masks. Jeez, what is going on here? I don't know. Team two, away from the action, was lulled into complacency. Team one made its way to the lunchroom. Werner's floor plan told the men where to find it. There's five of them. They made their move. They handcuffed everybody so that nobody could move. They all had masks on so that there would be no issue of uh, being recognized. Uh, in the sense, it was fairly uh, proficient, professional. The goal was to capture the supervisor who had the key to the high value room. Catching him and the other roving employees would present more of a challenge. This was the most dangerous part of the plan. If just one person evaded their net, the whole scheme could crash down around them. And during the, the robbery, uh, there was one glitch. A worker for Lufthansa who was doing his rounds came back and he noted the van and noted that something was suspicious. When he got out, they grabbed him. Hearing the commotion, the warehouse manager stepped out to see what the problem was. Come here, come here, come here. I got one right here, I got one right here. Get it, let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go. Both men were forced into the van. Get, get in here. You gotta stay down, stay down. Get your face down. Don't even look at me. Right, stay down. Realizing that they had been seen without their masks, the robbers took the captives' IDs and read their addresses. You, give me your wallet, give me your wallet. We're going to see what's taking us Okay, give me a wallet. Turn around. I didn't say you look at me. You have a red on me. I'm going to come after and find you. They threatened to kill them if they went to the police. I'm going to come after and kill you. You understand me? Do you understand me? Yes. Get down there. You, don't move. All right. Don't move. All right. The supervisor, unaware he was being tricked, answered an urgent call to come to the lunchroom. Don't be afraid. And fell into the hands of his captors. Don't get hurt. You Rudy? Huh? You Rudy? 
They demanded to know where the security guard was. The supervisor didn't know. They didn't trust him. So they took him along on their hunt for the guard. The security guard, the only one on the graveyard shift, had been employed at Lufthansa less than two weeks. He was still trying to learn the procedures and already grappling with the stultifying boredom of late night security. Go, go, go. Hands on the head, hands on the head. Once the guard was subdued, Team One began looking for the two missing employees. They could be anywhere. Don't lie to me. I don't know. Watch these. The garage door rolled open, and they learned that Team Two matters under control. Two? How many you got? I got two. Where's somebody else? In the lunchroom. We got two down here. Get those two in here. Get those two down here. Get those two down here. Get those two down here. Everyone was accounted for. Get out! Get out! Get out! They then forced the supervisor to hand over his alarm keys. Where is it? Where's the alarm? It's right there. Wait a minute. Let him do it. At the last moment, they had second thoughts and had the supervisor turn off the alarm himself in case there was some trick Don't involved. Screw okay. Don't screw up. Is that it? That's it. Huh? That's, That's it. it. Don't lie to me. That's the manager was a uh, uh, did the right thing and said, look, take the money, just don't hurt anybody. So everything went as smooth as it possibly could. Come on, let's go, around here, hurry up. Go, 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 come on. On to the high value room, where the most valuable items were held until they could be shipped out. Faster, Rudy, you're yeah, not moving get that fast thing enough. Open. Come on, get in there. Go get the other guys. Open it up. I don't have all night. Back up, hands on your head. Move, oh, get him out of here. Come on, come on. get out of here. Get out. On this night, the high value room held unmounted gems and a shipment of currency en route to Chase Manhattan from Germany. Most were used bills collected from American tourists. Money that's impossible to trace. Invigorated by their success, the men loaded 72 boxes in a matter of minutes. They kept unloading and unloading and unloading and before they knew it they they were lo unloading boxes of money and jewelry until they just filled the, the van to the brim and had to leave stuff there it was time to move out a little over an hour after they arrived the roberts lounge gang left richer for the experience they kept to the speed limit the van was followed by a chase car driven by accomplices who would try to distract any pursuing police. It wasn't necessary. The getaway was clean and quick. It was just after 5 a.m. when the van pulled into a warehouse garage and out of sight. began the happy task of unloading their haul. They'd each get their cut, but only after Burke and the Mafia Dons got theirs. Though the haul looked larger than the thieves had anticipated, it would never make them rich. That's not how it works in the mob. The top guys get the money, the workers don't get a lot. 
they weren't getting more than 50,000 each. That was it, 50, 60,000. They weren't going to get a million dollars. Burke asked one of his henchmen, Stax Edwards, to get rid of the van. A car crusher was already reserved. There would be nothing to tie Burke's gang to the crime, or so it seemed. Because Burke immediately took control of the money, his men had to learn about the size of the hall by hearing it on the news. At approximately 3.45 this morning, what was reported to us by Lufthansa Airlines was a armed robbery of approximately, according to Lufthansa, three to five million dollars, which has not been verified at this time. The whole country was talking about it. Final estimate, around seven million dollars in unmarked currency and a million in unmounted gemstones and gold. The loot was virtually untraceable, the haul unprecedented, the timing impeccable. And then they realized how big it was. And you know, uh, bottom line was it was too much, it was too big. And that's what caused their undoing. That's what everybody, they crumbled because of it. It was just too big for them. The men's fee now seemed like peanuts. It paled in comparison to what the FBI was offering for information about the crime. Some of the gang hinted to Burke that they'd need more money to keep his name out of it. The magnitude of the caper assured that the authorities weren't going to give up until it was solved. The FBI knew by how smoothly it went that it was an inside job. When they questioned the Lufthansa employees, two names kept coming up. We had people saying that Grunwald and Werner were involved in this. We had uh, uh, enough people saying it, but not enough evidence. Nobody to testify that they knew any of the details. And uh, so, but we keep an eye on, an eye on these people. Just Is that what you think? Just Just take the whole when thing. Werner arrived at work the next day, Peter Grunwald confronted him right away. He knew that Werner had stolen the plan and betrayed him. Grunwald told him he wouldn't get away with it. Werner was confident he already had. FBI investigators knew that Werner and Grunwald couldn't have pulled it off by themselves. They had another suspect. When this happened, everybody in law enforcement was taking claim to it because everybody, you know, Port Authority at JFK had knew Jimmy Burke. They, they knew of his uh, involvement at the airport. It was just a matter of connecting Burke with the crime. The courier and the warehouse manager gave police descriptions of the two men who held them in the van. The warehouse manager got the best look, but it was only a glimpse, and he was too terrified to remember much. This could have been the FBI's big break, but that's not how it turned out. Well, we tried to uh, uh, do an artist conception with him. We came up with something, but it, it really never, we couldn't do anything with it. Three days after the heist, a parking officer in Brooklyn spotted a van matching the one the victims described. The van had been reported stolen. A warrant was granted, and it was searched and dusted for fingerprints. Prints found in the van led nowhere but detectives did find the wallet belonging to one of the victims. This was definitely the van used in the Lufthansa heist, the van that Stax Edwards was supposed to have destroyed. Several days later, detectives found Stax Edwards shot to death in his apartment. We knew that he hung out in uh, Robert's Lounge. We knew that he was kind of a knock-around guy. As soon as he shows up dead with a bullet in the back of his head, you put two and two together, okay? He was involved in it. Clearly, he must have been involved in it because we knew Burke was involved at the time. 
Meanwhile, Lewis Werner began receiving portions of his cut, 10% of the total take. It arrived a little at a time in a variety of clandestine ways. Then, unable to control his conspicuous consumption, Werner bought a new van. The FBI didn't fail to notice his newfound wealth. They were already watching him, and they'd learned that his bookie was Marty Krugman of the Roberts Lounge Gang. Krugman was the connection to Burke that investigators needed. But when they paid a visit to Krugman, they were only half surprised that he wasn't there. When he failed to reappear, he was presumed dead. His body has never been found. The links between Jimmy Burke, the crime boss, and Lewis Werner, the inside man, were breaking one by one. Every time you got a lead, every time you found somebody else that might have been involved in the case, you, you would uh, uh, try to act as quickly as possible. So just as we get one thing, the next you turn around another body, another dead body, another dead end. Extremely frustrating. The FBI thought if they put pressure on Werner, he'd give them the connections that would lead to Jimmy Burke. To get to Werner, they pressed his old friend, Peter Grunewald. He was subpoenaed as a material witness. And that's when everything starts to unravel. Because once Grunewald is put under pressure, uh, he falls like an accordion. The FBI orchestrated an accidental meeting between Grunewald and Werner at headquarters. You take the heat for the whole Grunewald had already told yeah. authorities about how he conspired with Werner, I don't know how Werner stole his plan and robbed Lufthansa without him. Werner still proclaimed his innocence. But I know nothing about him. Even so, investigators had everything they needed to charge him with the crime, but they were after bigger game. Jimmy Burke and the Roberts Lounge Gang. Werner refused to cooperate. He demanded to go on trial, denied everything. They would say, Louis, listen to us. You can't beat this case. We're prepared to offer you a reasonable deal. You can tell us who you talked to from Jimmy Burke's gang. That's the critical connection we need. Without you, we cannot make that connection. Investigators say Lewis Werner is a Their pleas fell on deaf Heavily ears. In debt to associates of the Paul Verri Werner stood trial and received a 15-year sentence. After several months, his thoughts cleared. He decided to talk, to tell authorities who his contacts were. But he was too late. Now he's finally going to tell the truth. He's going to finally tell the story. What's the problem? The problem is the guy's whose name he mentions is dead because Burke has anticipated just that very possibility. He was found in the basement hall. There's a saying that three may keep a secret if two of them are dead. By killing off most of his gang, Burke had successfully severed his ties to the Lufthansa caper, leaving police with nothing. But the most elaborate American caper of its kind was also the most futile. Nobody involved with the heist lived to spend their money. Burke regretted the day that he heard about all his money to be robbed at Lufthansa because he said the money turned out to be cursed. Whoever it touched, whoever got near that money, died or went to prison. It was almost as if the money was toxic. Jimmy Burke was sentenced to life in prison on unrelated charges. Louis Werner was the only person to be charged for the crime. None of the $8 million has ever been recovered. It's presumed to be in the coffers of organized crime.